Welcome to section 38 of the Anatomy Online. In this section we're going to discuss the bones of the skull. We'll start by asking a question. A maxillofacial surgeon examines radiographs of a head trauma victim. Which bone contributes to the anterior cranial fossa, nasal cavity, and both orbits? The answer is actually B, the ethmoid bone which will have the components of the medial wall of each orbit. It will have the uh, horizontal and vertical plate in the crystagalli into the cranial vault and the descending vertical and horizontal plates that are going to be components of the uh, visceral cranium. Let's look a little bit further at some of the parts of the skull. We have the neurocranium that we've discussed already, and we'll just discuss the different bones of the neurocranium. There are eight bones in this neurocranium. Four are unpaired, and only two are paired. The frontal ethmoid sphenoid occipital bones are unpaired, and there are two parietal and temporal bones. Remember the neurocranium, when we talked about the development of the skull, is the component that houses the brain. The visceral cranium makes up the face and the jaw, and it has 14 bones. Two of them are unpaired, and the rest are paired. The mandible and vomer, which plows through the midface, are not paired. All of the others are paired. This will just look through and label some of the different portions of the bone that you can familiarize yourself with again. And uh, a couple of the things that you're going to be interested in are the inion and the nasion, as well as the glabella, uh, and the sutural lines like the squamosal suture, the coronal suture, the terion, and the lambdoidal suture posteriorly. The terion is of clinical significance, especially for testing in the USMLE, because of this thin plate of bone where there are four bones coming together, frontal, parietal, temporal, and sphenoid uh, is very thin table and the middle meningeal artery runs directly behind it so it can be severed during accidents leading to epidural hematoma and potentially death. Here's another view of some of these vessels as they distribute across the skull in the norma lateralis or lateral view. There are altogether around 28 bones, including the ossicles of the skull. Uh, there can be little extra vermian bones, which you can see uh, the, between the parietal and the occipital bone in this particular um, sketch. Let's zoom in on some of the imaging structures that you're going to be interested in finding. If we zoom in on this frontal portion, you can see the orbital rim, which usually makes a dense plate of bone as the x-rays shine through it. The frontal bone itself with the cortical layers on the outside and the diploic bone in between. We zoom in on the posterior inferior aspects. You can see a nice cella tersica for the pituitary fossa, underneath of which is the sphenoid sinus. Then you can see the dense petrous bone, which will house the inner ear. And you can actually see two holes in that dense petrous bone. Those are going to be the external auditory meati on both sides of the skull. So they are overlapping because remember, as a plane film, this is three dimensions compressed down into two dimensions. We have the mastoid air cells. Notice the lucency that's posterior to the petrous bone. If we look a little bit lower on this image, you can start to see the maxillary sinus, which will oftentimes have involvements with the maxillary teeth and can cause infections by transmitting either a tooth infection into the maxillary sinus or a sinus infection into the maxillary teeth. They can make out the hard palate, um, which is going to be the maxillary shelf. We'll talk more about that when we talk about clefting of the palate. You can see a dens protruding up through the anterior and posterior arches of C1. And then you can see the 
mandible with the mandibular canal showing up as a slight lucency uh, within the mandible itself. We have the mandibular rami. And of course you can't see everything in every image so you're better not to try and make sure that you get a new image or you're trying to look specifically for something and then you would have duplicate images. Now if we're looking at the sutures from the superior view we have the coronal suture, the sagittal suture, and the lambdoidal suture where the bregma is at the top or the apex of the highest point of the skull. If you look at the films, you can see that there is an overlap of the sutures in this particular person. But remember, this is three dimensions compressed down into two. So if we re really zoom in on that, you can see the sutures, but this is actually the lambdoidal suture that's shining through from the back of the skull, all compressed down into one. Then you can make out the orbital rim, which is quite dense because of its... Um, alignment with the travel of the x-rays in a frontal plane. And if we zoom in on this one, this is the portion that makes this x-ray interesting in that through the orbit you can see on both sides the auditory and vestibular apparati within that temporal bone. Um, it's not in the orbit, but it's more posterior because of the three-dimensional uh, compression. We have a nasal septum running in the midline and we'll move on from there to a question. A 40-year-old man suffered a fracture of the right terion as a result of a car accident. The CT scan showed an image consistent with an epidural hematoma. Which artery has been damaged? We were talking about this momentarily uh, a few minutes ago and hopefully you remember that it's the middle meningeal artery that travels through and along the terion and is susceptible to laceration from that inner table of bone along that uh, very narrow portion of bone of the temporal bone. Now you may remember that it was the middle meningeal but do you remember which foramina it travels through? To enter into the cranial vault it travels through foramen spinosum traveling from the infratemporal fossa up through that foramina and along the skull. Let's think a little bit more about some potential head traumas that could be tested in the USMLE. The contra coup injury would be something to be aware of and those are going to be skull fractures that are opposite the point of initial impact. So if you get an impact on the frontal aspect of the skull Sometimes you'll have a case which will discuss some occipital changes, especially once you tie this into neuroanatomy, you may see visual effects as a result of a contra coup injury on the opposite side. Terion fractures are going to be another one, and we've already talked about how they can tear the middle meningeal artery. And the depression fractures can also um, look at compressing the underlying brain. If there's a scalp laceration, you can get infections that will travel through into the cranial vault, maybe even leading to meningitis, which uh, these lacerations, because of those emissary veins, will carry the infection into the skull as well. Skull-based fractures are typically from a blow to the top of the head that can come around and fracture the skull base, and these oftentimes have related cranial nerve injuries because of the positioning of the brain stem along the skull base. They will also oftentimes lead to CSF leakage from the arachnoid tears that can occur. The petrous temporal bone fractures uh, will cause CSF leakage from the ear. Anterior cranial fossa fractures can cause loss of smell because of the cribriform plate and they can also lead to the periorbital bruising or raccoon eyes from the CSF that will leak from the nose um, and out of the nasal cavity. Remember that these uh, CSF leaks tend to be clear or straw shaped uh, colored fluids and they oftentimes will have a sweetness to them because of the sugars that are present in CSF.
We mentioned earlier that the trochlear nerve is susceptible to injury as a cranial nerve that has a very long course from the posterior aspect of the brain, as well as cranial nerve 6, which has damage associated with it because of the um, problems with it running through the dura. Both are going to give you orbital effects, and we'll talk about the orbit a little bit later. Graphic demonstrating the contra coup injury with the coup being at the initial site of contact and the contra being at the opposite side of contact. Then we can see a CT data that's been reconstructed into a bone uh, three-dimensional surface rendering and you can see a depression fracture. Um, this kind of compression fracture is a terion fracture and uh, would have very deleterious effects for this particular person. These will in, inconsequentially or invariably um, result in epidural hematomas. Now they don't come on as fast as you might think, but they're still much faster than a subdural hematoma. What we've got in pink here are the paranasal sinuses and that we have a skull which is composed of a superior portion involving the cranium and then the mandible. So we have the orbit, the piriform fossa, and the four paranasal sinuses, and those will include the frontal, ethmoidal, sphenoid, and maxillary. The sphenoid is still paired as well, but the segments of it will oftentimes fuse together. On the cranial base, uh, these have been painted to match the netter pictures as closely as possible. You can see some of the interesting things. One that I'd like to draw your attention to would be the palatine process and the palatine bone and the incisive foramen that's anterior to the midline of the palatine process of the maxilla. And this will be the border between the... Um, primary and secondary palates as they look at formation of palate in the head and neck. Let's do another question. A patient arrives in the ER drunk and drooling. He's clearly groaning in pain but does not respond to your questioning. He's bleeding slightly from the mouth and intensifies his moaning when you came close to it. The image shows what was acquired and shows multiple fractures to the mandible. What portion of the mandible was broken? And here you have five options and hopefully you'll remember that the portion that was injured is the uh, body. In fact, there may be two to three fractures along the body of this jaw. Just like the pelvis, the jaws oftentimes hit and fractures in two places. We zoom in on this, we can start to see some of the features. The angle of the mandible is more posterior. There you can see the fracture that's in the body this would probably have significant tooth pain as well. And uh, now you can see the condyle, which would come up from in below. Now there's the other fracture. And you can see through uh, these lucencies, the C1, C2 allantoaxial facet joints. Nasal spine, you can see some fillings in their teeth, and a coronoid process for the attachment of um, the temporalis muscle.